welcome to this week's episode of Heads Up. I'm retired school counselor, Sue Mullen, and with me is my co-host, licensed family therapist, Diane Vaccarello. Good morning, Diane. Good morning, Sue. Hey, listen, I don't wanna say anything, but um, there are two other people in the room with us. I noticed. Okay, so this is a big <laughs> moment for those of us on Heads Up, because we have our first official guest appearances taking place this morning. Uh, it brings me great pleasure to introduce Carol LaMarche and Candace Porter, who are here representing an organization that actually is a Bedford grown organization called uh, Connors Climb. And uh, today's topic aptly is uh, suicide prevention and awareness. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Candace and Kara, and we're going to kick this thing off. Um, Diane, I told you that I have described us as being Hoda and Kathy Lee to a number of people, <laughs> minus, minus the mimosa. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, I would encourage you to co truly co-host with me and jump in and ask our guests any questions, uh, offer any commentary that you have. And Sounds just so that you two know, I'm a bit of a taskmaster on keeping time. The only thing you really need to worry about is when we get towards the end of our time together, I will uh, warn all three of you that we're about to wrap up. So good morning, Kara and Candace. Good morning. Thank good morning. you guys for having us. Oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to have you. Um, I would love to hear right from the get-go how Connor's Climb got started and how the two of you actually became part of Connor's Climb. So uh, you can flip a coin or just decide amongst yourselves who's going to speak first. I'm going to let Candace tell you. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. And you know, so Candace Porter, I am a Bedford resident, mom of two spunky girls who go to Riddlebrook School. We've been living in this community for about seven years now, and I've been working with Connors Klein Foundation for about over three years at this point. And who we are, so Connors Klein actually was born out of Exeter, New Hampshire and unfortunately was created in the aftermath of a ninth grade student, Connor, who was a freshman at Exeter High School. And as we know, everyone reacts differently after a time of crisis and trauma. And Connor Ball's family, primarily his mother, Kara Ball, who's our founder, she came together with her family and her friends and said, you know, we need to do something about this. And, you know, looking hindsight, maybe we did miss things, maybe we could have done more, but moving forward, what can we do to help prevent this tragedy from happening to anybody else? So it really born into a group of family and friends coming together and doing a fun 5K in the Exeter community area with the goal of bringing suicide prevention education into the Exeter School District. And me, myself, I'm a social worker by training and I've been doing suicide work for almost 20 years and was doing it on the national level which was a, a key piece of the evidence-based program that we support schools using. It's called the SOS Signs of Suicide. So I had met Tara and Connors Climb when I was working nationally back in Massachusetts. And long story short, you know, as I moved here with my family and kind of switched that national role to try to become more local, I fell in love with the organization, its mission, and you know, we've now grown. So working with one district has turned into over 80. And we have been key with trying to do statewide awareness. So of course, our mission is to provide suicide prevention education to New Hampshire youth and communities. But we're also trying to do just kind of raising it in a positive, uplifting way. And you know, what started off as really intervening has turned into what we call upstream prevention. What can we all do early and often to actually prevent a point of crisis so it's a it's a tough topic uh yep. talk, talking about suicide uh yep. i've actually had the pleasure of speaking to all three of you uh about the idea of coming on to the show and um 
Uh, yeah, there's a there's a whole lot of pain and and emotion that goes along with talking about suicide. So I applaud your your efforts, Candice. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think so we're we're trying to make this not a scary topic as well, and that it is something that's appropriate and manageable to kind of bring into the limelight. You know, a lot of the work you're doing with your show and. You know, Diane, I watched last night what you are the first series that you did in our art district here is just trying to bring people to the table and have the conversation. And yeah. early on, you know, I would be at dinner parties with my husband, you know, the typical what do you do for work kind of questions come up and I would say a therapist for many years. Mm -hmm. And then I started saying, you know what, but I'm actually a suicide prevention expert and I'm going to lead with that and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a couple things happen. Folks are usually engaged, usually because they've been touched, or you're in scenarios where you notice folks are, you know, kind of turning and not wanting to have the conversation and saying, why are you talking about your work? I'm like, well, everyone else talks about their work in these scenarios. So right. just kind of normalizing that it's okay to not be okay, and it's okay to talk about it. So, you know, Kara, I'll let her kind of introduce herself, but, you know, the beauty of growing kind of grassroots, as we do in New Hampshire, to expanding has been the ability to um, kind of pull in another wonderful resource, Kara, who can introduce herself. Yeah. So, Kara, how did how did you how did you become involved with Candace and with Connor's Climb? Sure. So, I met Candace through a mutual close friend, and 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 honestly, we were on a walk one day, and uh, I had known a little bit about what Candace did for work, and uh, she just started sharing more about it, and. Um, you know, my background's in marketing, but at the same time, you know, I have a strong feeling and, and connection to, uh, thankfully not suicide, but mental health. Um, you know, my father was bipolar. Uh, it was highly stigmatized. Um, I didn't find out honestly until I was an adult, my parents are divorced. So it was, you know, just something that, you know, talking with Candace and talking about the fact that, you know, they're saying is stick it to stigma, which you can't quite see on my sweatshirt, but that's, um, you know, the secondary mission. The first is of course, to provide the education, but the secondary is to stick it to stigma. And that's always been something very close to my heart, just really saying, you know, the way that we can combat this problem is to talk about it openly. And so she and I just, you know, really connected um, on a personal and professional level. And it's now been uh, over a year that we've been working together and we've done some really exciting stuff and we're excited to keep going and, and continue to, you know, share our message. And, um, you know, I also was able to watch, even though it was my son's birthday yesterday, I had one earbud in for with my phone watching Diane and uh, the other was watching Age of Ultron for the 500th time with my 11 year old. And, um, you know, I loved the, the messages that you were sending. It was clear, concise, and, you know, we can certainly go over, you know, a lot of that stuff that, that you touched on. Um, because all of it is suicide prevention. All of this is suicide prevention. It's not just talking about suicide. I'm so glad that you say that, Kara. And, and thank you, Candice, also for just both of your points around the idea of normalizing and destigmatizing. That's the key aspect of this. It's earlier prevention is best. And I always say, as far as you know, any topics with mental health, particularly suicide, there's a lot of fear around that. And so people hesitate sometimes to even bring it up or talk about it. But a lot of these things, as well as substance misuse, it, it lives in the darkness. It hides behind curtains and we have to pull those back because that's the only way we're going to make forward progress. And, um, you know, I, I say it's not a question of if we should talk about it or even, you know, when sometimes is a good conversation, but how, how do we talk about it is really what we need to focus on. And, and it shouldn't even be a question of if. Absolutely. So to that point, you know, we talk about the myths and facts is sort of the, the first thing we start on with our trainings. Um, so we do trainings throughout, you know, the state of New Hampshire. And as Candace mentioned, we're in over 80 schools um, or 80 school districts, I should say, not schools. Um, and, you know, we talk about, you know, the number one myth is if you talk about suicide, you're going to give somebody the idea. And, you know, the opposite is obviously true. There's so much data and evidence to back that up. Um, and then the second one, which I just encountered 
just a few weeks ago in the hockey rink was, you know, people who talk about suicide won't really do it. Um, and that's not true either. And it's, you know, you have to take every instance seriously. And, you know, no matter who the person is saying it, you have to take those things seriously. So those are, you know, the two things that we, we really, you know, stress right from the get-go. And I um, ask, um, can I ask a question about the prevalence of, uh, of suicide? Um, how, how prevalent is suicide? Does it differ among age groups? Well, and, it, uh, and, and what, do, do we have any kind of sense of uh, what percentage of people who set out to commit suicide actually end up ending their lives? Okay, absolutely. go. So here in New Hampshire and nationally, suicide is the second leading cause of death for our youth. And this goes up to the age of 34. Okay, and so in these trainings, it's having these conversations of, Above suicide, it's, it's unintentional, unintentional injuries, which, you know, that can include an overdose, a car accident, you know, accidental. Mm -hmm. But for the second leading cause of death, it is a public health problem. It's a huge public health problem. And as we look to um, older adults, it is still on the rise. And, you know, those are trends that we're really paying attention to, especially middle-aged white men. You know, there's an alarming growth that's happened over the past five years that that group that was traditionally, you know, kind of closer to the seventh and eighth leading cause of death, it's starting to rise. And, you know, that we know that um, most people who die by suicide have at least one mental health issue or diagnoses, often undiagnosed. And the number one is depression. So, you know, we do know that, but we also know that most depressed people are not suicidal. So a part of this is, you know, putting the information out there, but not having folks kind of be panicked and, and fearful. And right. we do know that, you know, if you have made a previous attempt, you are more likely to actually complete and have a, a second attempt. But we also know that um, many lives can be saved if they're appropriately intervened with. So, you know, a percentage, it really, it really varies. You know, you look at males, females, it goes to the means that they're using. We know that males often use more lethal means. So, you know, the, the um, ability to intervene in the crisis is often, you know, that's kind of inhibited greatly. And we also know, um, you know, that especially for our youth, it is more likely to be verbalized and there's opportunity. So the, the data gets a little fuzzy when you look at 10 years old and below as far as actual suicide, but there is dialogue and there are opportunities to actually intervene and we know that treatment works. You know, if you slip and fall, you break your arm, you go to the hospital, they fix it. The same is true with any kind of mental health crises, especially suicide. If you're willing to verbalize it to a trusted adult, we know that treatment is available and it works. So, you know, part of what we're training both our adults and our youth is a message we call acting. So what do you do? How do you act? We're really encouraging the idea of acknowledge, care, and tell. So first, you have to acknowledge for yourself or in a loved one that you're seeing signs and symptoms or you're hearing things and it's serious. And Candice, you just said that um, most, it, it, am, is this an accurate statement? And please, at any point in time when we're talking, if I say something that is inaccurate, yep. correct me. Okay. Um, so is it an accurate statement to say that most people that are thinking about ending their life either talk about it or give some sort of an outward sign? Yes, the majority of people do give some kind of signal or um, you know, warning sign of their intention, the majority of people. And you know, we're actually looking at youth themselves. Mm -hmm. We do know if it is kind of brought to the, the forefront that they are able to successfully get help and get treatment. And, you know, there's an interesting movement going on right now that is actually looking at what we call the, the survivor voice. And these are individuals with lived experience where they've made an attempt and unsuccessfully, but are now sharing their story and talking about what they wished happened prior to their attempt. And it's really doing amazing work with informing our practice as clinicians, as well as kind of parents and educators. So, you know, there's a, a gentleman, Kevin Hines. So mm -hmm. he has a story about, 
he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and, and lived to tell his story. So he really has done some interesting work of, you know, what can we do? And how do we actually give someone, you know, literally the lifesaver and have them actually to grab onto the raft, so. So pretty important then that if, if the majority of people are actually giving some sort of indicator that they're uh, that seriously thinking about it, pretty important that we be open to hearing it. Correct, yep. And then the, you know, the care, that we feel comfortable, how do we show that we care and mm -hmm. articulate to this person that, you know, we need to get you some help. And then the tell piece is, you know, we're having our youth say, you have to tell a trusted adult. And then the adults understanding that you are a trusted adult. And if you don't feel comfortable responding, you need to help that individual find someone that, that is comfortable. And, you know, Diane, I've heard things that came up in your first presentation that you did for our school district you know, towards the end, it, it always comes up of the issue with a lack of providers, a lack of, um, you know, availability of, of beds and facilities. And, you know, that is a challenge in our state that we're working on. But that being said, you know, the availability of a resource isn't going to change whether or not I'm in a suicide crisis. So the, the, we do know that if we can intervene early and often, that we hopefully will mitigate that need to go to that final end result. So, you know, we always try to keep that wheel going and not have it be a, you know, why are we gonna address it if we can't do anything about it? Well, th that doesn't make sense. And I also say highlighting the need also helps justify the need for more resources as well, so. I couldn't agree more. And that's why I've sort of talked about it as um, going bigger. And it, you know, it may not be accessing mental health at that moment, um, but going bigger can be bringing it to the pediatrician, bringing it to the school guidance department, bringing it to other trusted adults, and obviously mental health providers at various levels. Um, but we do need to go bigger and be more systemic in the way we think about it, approach it, and respond. Um, because the idea is that the isolation variables, you know, there's certain factors with depression, as you mentioned, is one of the most common elements. But some of the factors that um, are inherent with that are a form of isolation. It's a sense of helplessness and hopelessness, basically stuck. And so a big part of this is movement um, in opening up the space to a larger system. And um, there is hopefulness in that. And that's why it's important not to, you know, we do have limitations in our state. We're doing everything, you know, to continue to address those. And they're very systemic. Um, but meanwhile, we need to really think about it along those lines of opening up, going bigger, bringing it out into the forefront of the stage in the light. Absolutely. And I was listening to your show, and then I'll, I'll ask Kara this, but, you know, previous episodes, you've talked about living your authentic self and, you know, really looking at how to enhance our protective factors. Yes. So, you know, a lot of this for us as parents and trusted adults, we want to know like the red flag warning signs, but what we can do on a daily basis is identify, you know, how are we going to encourage thriving and surviving? Mm -hmm. And when you think about it through a clinical, Diane, I'm sure you've had to do this. You know, part of asking these kind of hard questions to someone is you're verbalizing that maybe you want to die, you might want to take your life, there's no point anymore. But then also asking the questions, why do you want to live? You know, what actually is, is good in your life and how can we make that stronger and bigger in the, the same lens of what you well, were saying? And I wonder how many people, um, I, I certainly saw it in my professional life and to a certain degree in my personal life, how many people say, um, you know, oh, I want to die. Uh, well, I'm thinking two things. I'm thinking how many people say that because they lack the ability to actually and accurately express what they're experiencing. And then my, my other comment is how many people, or uh, I'm, I'm guilty of it myself sometimes, use it as kind of um, a glib sort of, uh, oh, you know, kill me now, that kind of thing. Uh, because I think that uh, part of getting rid of the stigma is being able to acknowledge how real this is, yeah. how powerful it is, 
And that may be one of the reasons that people have a hard time getting around to it and knowing what to do is because they themselves are paralyzed with fear over not knowing what to do if they have a loved one who is so depressed that they're actually thinking about lethality and a means. Right. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about at the start about normalizing the conversation, um, eradicating the myths around it. Um, and changing our dialogue, changing our communication. You know, there's so much talk about, you know, political correctness. And, you know, we say, well, you know what, how about we think about it in, in different terms? How about we think about, instead of saying political correct, how about, you know, language that shows others that we care? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're going to use language that says, you know, that person died by suicide as opposed to committed suicide. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to change our language, change our dialogue around those things and, and eradicate. And, and I'm guilty of it too. I know actually on one of our trainings, I said committed, he committed suicide. And I was like, oh my gosh. So <laughs> I'm still learning. Um, you know, I'm still growing on all of these things. Um, well, but for Kara's point with that, you know, it's, it's correcting people in a caring way also. So, mm -hmm. sure. you know, I, we're all guilty of it at times and the commitment <laughs> is, uh, kindness is free. You know, I think, you know, the commit word, that is what our common media uses. And a lot of the work we do is making sure that our, our media is doing appropriate communications. And why that kind of triggers folks is, you know, it kind of relates to committing a crime or, you know, really trying to hurt someone else where, you know, it's a die by or completed because it's really about that person. You know, they're not doing it to harm or injure anyone else. They might think that they're actually helping someone else. So that's kind of one piece to also, you know, having folks know it is serious. And, you know, I worked with a woman in development around suicide prevention fundraising, and she would constantly say, you know, kill me now, or, you know, would do the, you know, hand to the head, gesturing a, a weapon. Right. But that's, a, it's doing it in a lighthearted way and not making folks feel uncomfortable because then they won't be willing to talk about it again. So, mm -hmm. you know, especially with our faculty, we, we engage and, you know, we're challenging everyone. We're training not only, you know, our mental health teams, we're training everyone in the entire building, all the paraprofessionals, you know, Food every, you know the bus drivers. Yeah, and this might be the first time that they're actually getting really mental health focused education and training. And that's okay, it's one piece because what they believe is what the, the young, young children below them are going to believe and it, we kind of carry on that cycle. And then something that will be put on here at the end that I will keep calling out to, you know, whenever we're talking about suicide, it's really important to make sure we're talking about 24 hour resources, which we really promote the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which will be included here, as well as the crisis text line, especially with our young adults. You know, they can do a simple text and engage and get immediate help if they feel like they don't have a trusted adult live that they can talk to. All right. Excellent. Excellent information for them to have. Diane. Can I just add it? Because I appreciate Candice's comment about um, texting and 24 sort of coverage. One of the reasons that's so important is because something like thinking about suicide or acting on suicide, it is... Um, so often something that happens in a tiny window of time, it can be a fleeting thought as well. It doesn't have to be something that's been there for a long, long time, or it can be something that comes in and out. And so when someone is um, in that moment of time, timing matters. And so being able to act on something like that and have accessibility, accessibility is key to so many different things, um, but it's really important to be able to access something in the moment. And so I really appreciate that comment. You know, Diane, one thing that you have said to me over and over again in these weeks since we've been doing this, uh, this program is how important it is for people to know that they don't always have to say what they're thinking or act on the way that they feel. And, uh, you know, I, th I, I think that's an important, an important feature here that on the one hand, we want to acknowledge how people feel because that's critical to their sense of well-being and the authenticity of the experience. But on the other hand, um, as part of this sort of resiliency toolkit that we hope everybody is developing, um, being able to say lots of people get depressed. Mm -hmm. Lots of people right. 
feel that there is no way out of a certain situation and lots of people do not die by suicide as a result of those feelings. You know, as uh, back to Candace's original point that uh, not everyone who is depressed has suicidal ideation. So, I, I mean, there's, there's just a, a ton of education to do, correct, ladies? Yeah, I mean, and we're breaking it down to, you know, we have the youth piece that we're really, you know, teaching our youth on how to care for themselves and others because, mm -hmm. You know, they're looking out for each other and you know whether or not we're telling them what they should do for themselves as an adult if we're helping them help their best friend or someone they really trust they're more likely to absorb and listen and then the other piece is helping our parents feel comfortable with maybe having their child come to them and say that their friend has verbalized or texted or posted something on social media that, that's real it happens every day and encouraging the parents to feel safe and comfortable to take the right action, which you know is reaching out to the school, reaching out to the parent. If the parent isn't being responsive, go the next step and reach out to the school and take it seriously each time because that is a window of opportunity. And it's hard. I think for our parents, that's a pretty fearful situation. I have multiple friends that have been in this situation, you know, here and, and actually nationally. And making sure that that's okay, that that kind of is normalized. And then the other piece with our, you know, the tell that CARE is really pushing with our, our hockey teams and other sports teams, having our coaches really understand what an important role they play, mm -hmm. both on and off the court, the field, the ice, and, you know, that they need to feel comfortable with this information as well, because, you know, they're that standard big figure for these, these kids. So we're kind of spreading that message. Yeah. Okay. You have opened a door to so much information and so much conversation, and we are about a minute away from wrapping up this session. So what I'm asking is whether or not you two would be willing to come back to continue this conversation, because I have additional questions, I'm sure Diane does, and we encourage our viewers to email BCTV with any questions of their own. So I would love to be able to do a part two and do sort of frequently asked or, uh, and hear more about like specifics about what you're doing with, uh, with youth in schools. So yes. And oh, absolutely. And you can go to our website and it's connorsclimb.org and find out different, you know, various information, including really specific warning signs, risk factors, you know, that 101 that we all need. But we're beyond gonna, that, We're gonna talk about all of that, Candace, yep, yep. next week. All right, and we, we're ready for it. So send your questions in and we would love to be prepared. All so right. Sarah, I noticed you had the same reaction I do every single week when you're like, what, a minute left? I want to just add in a piece of encouragement or however we want to frame it for everyone out there in, in the communities to actually encourage um, teens, yourself to have that. Not It used to be a, like an in case of emergency number in your phone, but this text um, crisis line number that will be put up at the very end of this and encourage everyone to have that in their cell phones, your teens, children, encourage your friends and see if you can have um, immediate and easy access to that on your phones. Well, and next right. time we get a chance to talk, Kara has developed a fantastic card that we're gonna make available that will do just that, so. Excellent. Yeah. We'll talk Excellent. about it offline. I'll tease it right here. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today. Thank and you. Uh, as I said, the minute we end this, this broadcast this morning, we're gonna be talking about setting you up for next week. All right, take care, everybody, and have a thank great you. day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. So if you're feeling low.